of René Guignon's longer works, Introduction to the Study of the Hindu Doctrines, was the first to be published, and in a sense it can serve as an introduction to all the others, but more especially to those which, like man in his becoming according to the Vedanta, set out to expound metaphysical doctrines under their more profound aspects and in greater detail. To anyone not already acquainted with the comprehensive nature of the author's point of view, the title of the present book can only afford a comparatively restricted idea of its scope, so that prospective readers, hitherto familiar with the usual works of erudition that pass under the general heading of quote-unquote Orientalism, might expect to find the Hindu doctrines treated here also as a quote, special field of research, unquote, with a view to results that could be of no practical value to the ordinary run of men, for such is the spirit in which the majority of Western scholars, amongst whose ranks must also be numbered Westernized Orientals, approach the study of all the traditional doctrines, irrespective of whether they belong to the East or to Europe itself. In contrast to the Orientalists, the author starts out with quite other ends in view, requiring an entirely different method for their realization, as well as an entirely different angle of approach. There is therefore no question of a, quote, special subject, unquote, and this book might just as well serve as a key to the understanding of any of the traditional doctrines, or of them all. As for the Hindu doctrines themselves, which only occupy part three, they have simply been selected to exemplify the principles and workings of a traditional civilization, this particular traditional form having been chosen because it was the most suitable for the purpose, as the author himself has explained. The order in which the subject matter is presented has been well calculated to carry the reader on from stage to stage, without ever calling upon him to take any sudden leap in the dark. Particular attention has been given to the nice choice of terms, such as lend themselves to unequivocal definitions. But this has been accomplished without having recourse to the clumsy and pedantic jargon that habitually congests modern scientific literature, and which, while serving to impress more gullible minds, rather tends to put off many otherwise well-qualified inquirers. Part 1 is mainly taken up with the task of clearing away certain ingrained prejudices that are part of the common inheritance from the quote-unquote Renaissance, with its adulation of the Greco-Roman culture and its compensating depreciation, both deliberate and instinctive, of other civilizations. All kinds of subsidiary questions are sorted out, largely historical in character, before passing on to part two, which is in many ways the most important section of the book where, by establishing the fundamental st distinctions between various modes of thought, the real nature of metaphysical or universal knowledge is made to stand out. This is it which forms the lifeblood of all tradition. An understanding of its nature is the first condition for any genuine intellectual exchange, whether between individuals or groups, and still more so for that personal realization, which is alone deserving of the name of, quote-unquote, knowledge, unqualified, the name which it still bears throughout the East. Thus words like religion, philosophy, symbolism, mysticism, superstition, etc., which people have come to use in a vague and often most misleading way, are here given a precise meaning through an investigation both of what they are and of what they are not, until finally metaphysic itself, together with the tradition which is its appropriate vehicle of communication, quote, in all the worlds, unquote, is allowed to emerge in its universality as knowledge of the principle which is also the goal, Alpha and Omega. The reader is now sufficiently well equipped for Part 3 with its more detailed examination of the particular tradition chosen to illustrate the theme, namely the Hindu doctrine and its applications at various levels, eventually leading up to the Vedanta, which constitutes its metaphysical essence. Lastly, Part 4 resumes the task of clearing away current misconceptions, but this time it is concerned not with the West itself, but with distortions of the Hindu doctrines that have arisen as a result of attempts to read into them, or to graft onto them, modern Western conceptions from a variety of motives. This prepares the way for the author's concluding chapter, in which he lays down the essential conditions for any genuine understanding between East and West, an understanding that can only come through the work of those who have attained to the realization of that 
quote, wisdom uncreate, unquote, which is not specifically ancient or modern, eastern or western, but universal, even though at the present moment it is in fact hardly to be met with, apart from possible individual exceptions, outside the eastern traditions. In view of the fact that the author's message is addressed in the first place to the western reader, whose need is in some senses the most pressing since the dwindling away of his normal tradition has left him well nigh without guidance in his quest for knowledge, it is imperative that he should be warned against taking the author's strictures on various features of Western civilization as evidence of some missionary activity or other on behalf of a particular traditional form. Such a warning might seem superfluous, for the author himself is repeatedly at pains to repudiate any such suggestion. But past experience has shown that some people refuse to be disarmed by any denial because their own predilection for controversy and proselytism leads them to attribute a similar attitude to others. And it will not be surprising, even after this caution, if some would-be critic asserts that Guignon wishes to discredit Christianity and to convert the Europeans into Hindus, as if Europe were not already sufficiently unchristian through its own efforts. In the East, misconceptions of this type are practically unknown, for it has not yet been forgotten for it has not yet been forgotten there that if ultimate truth is one and only, the language of truth necessarily consists of many dialects adapted to the needs of different races and individuals, with the recognition of the distinction between principal knowledge and the differing forms through which it must express itself, if it is to become intelligible to minds as yet unperfected. The wish to carry on any kind of propaganda can scarcely arise but it is quite otherwise with people who are almost completely possessed by the demons of sentimentality, and it is therefore necessary to repeat again and again that, for the Westerner, the first fruit of assimilating that metaphysical knowledge which has, quote-unquote, accidentally been preserved in the East, while being forgotten in Europe, would be the reconstitution of a traditional civilization in the West, complete in all its orders, whether intellectual, social, artistic, or otherwise. But such a civilization in its outward form, would necessarily be adapted to the special requirements of the European temperament. The present situation of the West is rather to be compared to that of the foolish virgins who, through the wandering of their attention in other directions, had allowed their lamps to go out, in order to rekindle the sacred fire, which in its essence is always the same wherever it may be burning, they must have recourse to the lamps still kept alight by their wiser companions, but once relighted, it will still be their own lamps that they will be lighted by, and all they will then have to do is to keep them properly fed with the kind of oil at their own disposal, refined and perfumed as befits their immediate purposes. A Hindu somewhere has written that the inability of Westerners to interpret the East is bound up with their failure to penetrate the deeper meaning of their own sages and even of the Gospels. Reciprocally, it may be said that by a genuine assimilation of the essential content of the Eastern traditions, they might be helped to recapture the spirit that dwells at the heart of Christianity itself, instead of restricting themselves, as generally happens, to a humanistic transcription of the doctrine many of them still profess, that relies for its authority almost exclusively on, quote, historical facts, unquote, that can be placed and dated, thus relegating to the background the universal character of its fundamental truth. Such are the benefits that Westerners might hope to derive from the serious pursuit of that knowledge to which this and kindred volumes are able to introduce them. Yet it is questionable whether the practical value of a book such as this would be any the less for the present-day Indians and other Orientals, since so many of them, through being made to suffer the elaborately organized ignorance that passes under the name of a, quote, modern education, unquote, often dearly purchased for them by still pious but unsuspecting or complacent parents, have had their powers of discernment so disastrously upset that they seem no longer capable of receiving ideas through the medium of their own language, and their readiness to swallow quite uncritically the most hazardous hypotheses, even those relating to their own traditional doctrines, provided they have been put forward by some European sociologist or philosopher, is evidence of a state of mind that can only be described as defeatist, and among these people are to be found men of supposedly high standing and illustrious lineage, 
occupying responsible positions as rulers, leaders, or instructors, but whose professed leadership is of the very essence of dependence and servility. To minds and wells in such a state, it may prove a solitary tonic to come upon the work of a European by birth, though an Oriental by spiritual affiliation, who is able to reinterpret their own tradition for them, and to remind them the highest conceivable knowledge is therefore the asking at their own doorstep, while at the same time enlightening them as to the true nature of Western civilization, both by giving it credit for some genuine achievements, as well as by exposing its many deficiencies. Part 2, in particular, by explaining the precise shades of meaning of many terms that English-speaking Orientals frequently make use of, but only half understand because their fluency in the foreign language is superficial and does not extend to the background, can be of the greatest service in helping these people to restore order to their bewildered thoughts. Besides, it is not only those who have gone so far in surrender who can derive profit from the reading of this book, for it is comparatively rare to find anyone in the East who has become possessed even of a smattering of Western languages or literature or science, and who has not at the same time unconsciously fallen a victim to some confusion. Though in many cases, the damage is still superficial, and if once it were repaired, the experience might help to render the patient immune to possible reinfection. For instances of this sort of thing, one has only to glance through many of the newer Hindu publications in English, even some that sincerely believe that they are expounding the orthodox teachings, in order to discover passages where quite unjustifiable concessions have been made to the modern outlook, especially under its pseudo-intellectual form of quote-unquote science, in an attempt to show that the ancient Hindu texts agree with certain fashionable theories of the present day, as if this were bound somehow to enhance the authority of the text in question. Besides, these comparisons usually rest on the basis of some quite misleading assimilation of Sanskrit and English terms. Again and again one comes across remarks that imply an acceptance of the modern Western scale of values, as if that were an unquestionable criterion of validity. To mention one case, in an exposition of the theory of caste, we have seen the Shudras actually assimilated to the quote-unquote proletariat, which is quite preposterous since the Western quote-unquote proletariat and quote-unquote bourgeoisie alike, by their plainly recognizable characteristics, clearly fall under the heading of shandalas or men deprived of vocation. So also, in another passage of the same work, in describing the four ashramas, or stages of life, it was suggested that attendance at school conceived after the Western fashion might be accepted as an equivalent alternative to the period traditionally due to be spent under the tuition of the guru. Another particularly common form of error, which crops up continually, is bound up with the use of such terms as quote-unquote evolution and quote-unquote progress, with all the loose thinking to which they give rise, and these examples could be multiplied almost indefinitely. As for those who are not Hindus by tradition, such as Muslims, Buddhist, Chinese, and others, they will find this work hardly less useful, for its first two sections will serve their needs equally well, and all they will have to do is to supply part three for themselves by substituting the doctrines of their own traditional form in place of the Hindu doctrine within the general framework as here laid down. So also in the last part, they will soon perceive that Hinduism is not alone in having been travestied by those who dabble in the interpretation of the Eastern teachings, and that the other traditions have all at some time suffered in like manner. In conclusion, a word should be said about those Orientals, and they are still a majority, though an unvocal one, who have not departed from their traditional norms, and many of whom might in a sense be compared to children, innocent indeed, but clearly as yet untried in the crucible of temptation. Clearly those among them who have actually attained a high degree of metaphysical realization stand in no personal danger, for they come under the gospel denomination of the quote-unquote chosen, whom henceforth no satanic assault can by any means cause to fall away. But for all those who are of lesser degree, the danger is real in view of the continual pressure around them, and it is good policy to be forearmed. Thus, if for the Westerner, a true knowledge of the traditional doctrines 
offers the only effective means of escaping the impending disaster that so many dread but feel powerless to prevent. Through a process of inward reintegration and of reform in the literal sense of the word, so also for the Easterner it remains the indispensable means of consolidation, self-renewal, independence, and recollection, and for the two jointly it spells the bridging of the existing rift. For all these reasons, it is much to be desired that this book, and others by the same author, should eventually be translated not only into European languages, as is being done at this moment into Spanish as well as into English, but also into the principal Eastern ones, so that each man may be able to read it in that language which most closely harmonizes with his own mental constitution. However, this must for the present remain a more distant hope, and meanwhile Eastern readers will have to be content to read it in a European tongue. It should be added that during the course of the present translation, the author has revised certain portions of the text. The present version, therefore, will be found to differ slightly from previous French editions.